Hey everybody, welcome back to my channel. This is Russ Barkley. I know what you're thinking. Why isn't he wearing flannel? Because it's a beautiful day here in Richmond and I had a chance to play some golf this week, so hence the golf shirt. Uh, in any case, this is our weekly research roundup for research published on ADHD. You'll find all the research over in the thumbnail sketch. There's a little less research published over there because I had to record this a couple of days early, being out of town, so I'll include any new research in next week's review. But in the meantime, there were three excellent articles worthy of our attention out of those published so far this week. So let's have a quick look at them. One of them actually isn't even out yet in the journal. It's a pre-proof, meaning a pre-print, of an article that will be published a little bit later this year. But they're letting us have access to the article because it's, of course, a rather important one. This article was published in the journal Value and Health, and it's a systematic review and meta-analysis of the economic burden and the service utilization of children with ADHD. And it was conducted by researchers primarily down in Australia, including my friend David Coghill. Uh, this article is important because it takes all of the published research that it was able to get data from, I'm going to screen down here, and put it into an analysis of all of the studies. So as you know, I like meta-analyses because they give us a better signal, they get rid of a lot of the noise, they take all the studies, put them together, and see whether there is a robust finding across the, in this case, large number of studies on the economic burden of ADHD in children. So they searched nine different databases to do this meta-analysis. They came up with 32 studies out there. By the way, if you want to see what some of those other studies found, have a look at my earlier video on this channel on just this topic, the economic burden of ADHD to society. But in this case, it's a meta-analysis of all of that data. And what did they find when it came to ADHD children. First, they found that these children, of course, used more pharmaceuticals than control children. Well, of course they do. One of the mainstay treatments evidence-based for ADHD is medication. They also found that they used more mental health services and special educational services. None of this is a surprise. It just documents what we already know. Kids with ADHD are more than twice as likely to need these services, in many cases, much, much more likely than their counterparts. Uh, and they also often go with unmet health needs that are not treated by the health system. But let's move on and take a look at the topic, which is the economic burden of ADHD. They found that the overall weighted mean across these studies was that ADHD children cost $5,319 per child with ADHD compared to $1,152 for their control counterparts. These are annual costs. So you can imagine if you multiply this by the number of years this child is within the family, you're looking at a substantial burden, $75,000 to $100,000 of added economic costs to this family and to society that may be paying these insurance claims. So to summarize then, what we're seeing here is that ADHD kids cost their families four to five times more in health care costs than typical children without ADHD. That's an enormous economic burden when we multiply that, as I said, by the number of years a child within a family and the number of children within that country that have ADHD. This is why you saw in my other video, we're talking billions of dollars annually is being expended on ADHD children compared to counterpart children. So there's a reason we need to get in and diagnose early and treat early and it doesn't just have to do with reducing comorbidity and reduce or improving quality of life uh, and even improving survival. It also has to do with reducing costs to families 
and to society. So uh, a great meta-analysis there on a very important topic. So if you want to know more about that topic, go look at my other video on economic costs as well, where you'll see that I talk about a number of different studies and findings besides those that were reviewed here. Next up in our review is a study on the comorbidity of autism spectrum and ADHD symptoms in a large population of individuals in Hong Kong. So this is just survey research and it focuses primarily on adolescents and young adults, but it's a large study. It's pretty good in terms of the way it was conducted. Uh, there are some exceptions to that. I'll talk about some issues I had with the study, but I thought it was important enough to talk about. So uh, this study appeared in psychiatric re or psychiatry research, excuse me, uh, and it involved 2,186 adolescents and young adults in Hong Kong, these adolescents and young adults were between 15 and 24 years of age, and then 1,200 of them were followed up for a year and did a second assessment at that point in time. Now, mind you, they're using rating scales only to separate these kids, or these young adults rather, into ASD, autism spectrum, ADHD, the combined group, and then a control group. Uh, what's wrong with that? Well, it's pretty good as a first pass to screen for these disorders. It would not be considered adequate enough to make a clinical diagnosis. Absent here is the judgment of clinicians, the use of DSM criteria in all its glory, the requirement that symptoms need to produce impairment in major life activities, among others, and then ruling out other comorbid disorders that might explain the symptoms. So there's a lot that goes on in clinical diagnosis that simply wasn't done in this study. And that's why they found rather high prevalence rates. For instance, they found a prevalence of over 13% for ASD in the population. That's unheard of. We know that the prevalence is closer to about one to one and a half percent when we do clinical diagnosis. They found a rate of about 10.6% for ADHD. That's more than two to three times higher than the prevalence of ADHD in the young adult population. So again, just shows you that when all you use is rating scales, you can overestimate the occurrence of a disorder within the population. And then they found that about 3% of individuals had comorbid cases of both disorders. That, that's not what's important to me here. It's not the prevalence rates. We can kind of ignore that. But the additional findings were as followed. Compared with the control group, the comorbid group experienced more psychotic-like experiences both at time one and during the follow-up period than did the group that had either disorder alone. That's going to be important because there's a study coming up next that's going to address this particular issue of comorbidity. But it may be that kids with comorbid disorders, or young adults in this case, have a higher incidence of psychotic-like experiences. They did find that the ASD group had poorer overall functioning. No surprise, we know that ASD ranges in severity along its spectrum, but also is linked up with intellectual disability as well. And it's no surprise to us that on average, individuals with ASD are more impaired or have more functional problems than people with ADHD. They did find that those with ADHD alone had higher rates of depression and anxiety. Again, no surprise, we've seen those two comorbidities link up with ADHD. Have a look at my other videos on comorbidity and you'll see what I'm talking about. But on average, about 25% or so of people with ADHD have depression and about 20 to 25% of kids and about 40 to 50% of adults with ADHD also have an anxiety disorder. The ADHD group reported a lower overall quality of, quality of life at one year follow-up. There were some additional findings here with regard to certain aspects of executive functioning. I'm not gonna go into that. To me, the more important thing here had to do with this linkage of each disorder with different comorbidities and outcomes. So uh, have a look at that study over in psychiatry research if it interests you, but let's move this along now to 
another very important study, this one on the risk of schizophrenia in youth with ADHD. This is an under-investigated topic. Generally, we thought that ADHD had little or no association with schizophrenia. And while that still remains true, we've seen a few studies suggesting that there's a somewhat higher incidence of schizophrenia linked to ADHD. Now, keep in mind, most people with ADHD have no risk of developing schizophrenia unless, of course, they have a genetic history of schizophrenia in their relatives. That makes sense. But what we want to know here is, is there an elevated risk or not? And if so, where is it most likely to exist? So uh, a very important study. This uses the entire healthcare database system from South Korea. So we're taking a look here at over 211,000 children and adolescents with ADHD broken down by whether or not they also had other disorders with their ADHD. What did the study find? It found that compared to ADHD alone, kids with ADHD and comorbidities had a 2.1-fold increase in the risk of being diagnosed with schizophrenia compared to those without comorbidity. So this kind of explains where the confusion was earlier in the history of ADHD. Some studies finding a risk, some studies not. This is telling us that it's comorbidity that determines risk for schizophrenia. And this study found that even people who only had ADHD at the beginning if they went on later on to develop additional comorbid disorders, usually ASD, anxiety, depression, and so on, they carried an elevated risk for schizophrenia later, uh, just as did the original group that had comorbidity. So it really does seem to be the development of second, third, and fourth disorders here, but at least one other disorder that elevates this risk of schizophrenia. What was the most likely disorder doing that? If we look further down here, it says that this was driven largely by comorbidity with autism spectrum disorder, followed by intellectual disability, then tic disorders, depression, and bipolar disorder. Those five disorders were the ones that seemed to drive the risk for schizophrenia. That makes perfect sense, doesn't it? I mean, we know that ASD is a variant of schizophrenia, that early in its history, it was in fact called childhood schizophrenia. And then we began to bifurcate it because of its unusual symptoms compared to cases of just schizophrenia. But it is thought to have a link to schizophrenia genetically. The same is true with intellectual disability and certainly bipolar disorder, particularly its manic episodes, has also at times been thought to be a variant of schizophrenia. Again, especially earlier in its history. So again, a very important study of an entire population of kids coming out of South Korea, finally answering the question, yes, there is elevated risk of schizophrenia. It's not an awful lot, most people don't get schizophrenia, but the risk is doubled if there is comorbidity with ADHD compared to just ADHD alone. So I hope you found these reviews interesting. I certainly did. Uh, if you're interested in other research, have a look at my thumbnail sketch. Uh, again, if you like my channel, please subscribe. Uh, and you'll get notifications as we post new videos. Uh, again, if you know others who might have an interest or a need for this channel, please recommend us to others. And as always, thank you all very much for tuning into this channel and keeping up with the scientific evidence on ADHD and related disorders. So I'll see you next week, everybody. Thanks for joining me. And as always, be well.